Hello, everybody. Welcome back. We have a bonus issue for you this week of Hops Geek News, a podcast that we talk about comic books, movies, TV shows, and of course, beer. We like to we like to drink beer. Usually, have a good theme going on with the beer that we're drinking. Um, like I said, we have a bonus issue this week, so we have a very very special guest joining us all the way from international waters, even though it's literally like right across the border. <laughs> um, for you, not me. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, might as well. You're, I'm closer to he is than I am to Lauren, which is funny enough. So uh, Ryan Curtis will be joining us. We'll be talking about his comic book that is coming out. It's called Slums of the Empire City. And uh, we read all three issues that are going to be releasing so far. There's a Kickstarter that we've been pushing if you've watched us on Twitter. So we're going to get into that. First things first, if you're here and you know how to find us, great. Welcome back. We really appreciate you. Um, if you don't know how to find us, search Hops News on all your favorite podcasting platforms. We release episodes weekly. We're on Good Pods, all sorts of things, Twitter, Geek Hops, Instagram, Hops Geek News. And as always, I am Matt, a.k.a. Mash. And tonight I am drinking a fitting beer. This beer is uh, probably one of my favorite breweries uh, from back home, Portland, Maine. Definitive Brewing Company. It's called Insufficient Funds, which is a triple dry hop, triple IPA with... It's actually 10.3%. Didn't realize that when I opened it, but hey, guess what? I don't have to work tomorrow, so let's party, right? It's uh, delicious. Like I said, this is one of my favorite breweries from uh, Portland, Maine, back in my old stomping grounds. So, uh, Lauren, what are you drinking? So you're actually drinking a higher ABV beer than me. That doesn't, doesn't seem happen, to ever happen. Like ever. Um, so because our guest has actually spent some time on the Supernatural set, I am drinking, because I was in Texas last month, I am drinking another Cosmic Cowboy IPA from Family Business Beer Company. Um, and anybody who's listened to us knows my love for Supernatural and that Denson Ackles is one of the owners in this brewery, and it's named after the show because they're in the family business of hunting monsters. And of course, I have it in my glass as well because I bought everything at the brewery when wow. I was there. <laughs> Can't believe it. Can't so, And this is only 7%, so it's a nice, easy uh, IPA for me. For sure, for sure. And like I said, we had a really special guest tonight who we are fortunate enough because this man literally does it all. He writes comic books, he works on special digital effects, and he also part he's a part owner of a brewery. So without further ado, Ryan, welcome to your uh, first ever appearance on The Geeks. How are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited because I'm drinking a beer uh, that I've never tried before. This is from, like you said, uh, Matt, I, I'm part owner in a brewery called New Tradition Brewery, which is on the west coast of Canada, where I am. It's uh, on Vancouver Island. It's a beautiful area. And this one is called, it's a limited release that I've never even tried. So this is our first taste on the podcast oh, called Ginger nice. Me Timbers. It's a, I'm going to say it wrong, a Quebec Ale? Oh, Quebec. Quebec Ale? Like K K V I E K. Yeah, is that like Icelandic? It seems Icelandic. Yeah, it's like a yeast strain from Iceland that like ferments super quick. Oh, there you go. Five uh, percent and twenty-three IBU. So I'm excited to try it. Nice. Um, the the head brewer is my sister-in-law Patty, and ah. this was one of the best sellers that they are making right now. And there was only a few cans left, and she sent one this way so I could try it, and I'm very very excited to give it a taste. Awesome. Nice. So first things first, you are uh, the part owner of this brewery. So how did uh, how did that come about? And you said that you're, you're you have relations to the head brewer. So is it kind of like the family business or how did that come about? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Patty, my sister in law and, and Tammy, her wife have been home brewing for, oh, I don't know, a decade or more. In fact, Patty's lineage goes back. Um, uh, her father did and his father father did uh, they were all brewers uh, at home so it just made good sense to move into a, a, a business and a couple of years ago right before COVID they opened a brewery which was not the best timing in hindsight but what can you do uh, so they've been having lots of fun and it was just a small uh, a small little community brewery but uh, but they're having a lot of fun. Nice. It does. Uh, you, when you sent us the website, we checked it out. It looked like a really, really gorgeous area of uh, Vancouver. That whole part is on my number one to go list. Like I, we moved here at the end of 2019 to Idaho where I'm at. And of course, right after that COVID happened. So like, I haven't made my way to that part yet, but I'm dying to, I, I can't wait to get out there and your brewery is definitely gonna be on the, uh, the to go to list once I do make oh, it. Oh yeah. There. That'd be awesome. Um, I, I wish I lived closer. It's about I don't know, it feels like about four hours and a, like a ferry to get there. So, and again, during COVID, we couldn't travel. So I haven't been there oh, in yeah. over a year, but 
um yeah well let me know and maybe i'll meet you there uh, when you guys come That'd over that'd be fantastic that would be, that would fantastic. be fantastic i know so, in canada the restrictions have been super tight if oh, i'm yeah. not mistaken like even with the shows that are filmed up there like they seem like they're stuck in the hotel for two weeks and then they can't go anywhere and all that so yeah it's finally lifting now that everyone's getting inoculized inoculized that's not a word i've only had a half a beer um <laughs> <laughs> getting their shots uh so yeah the, the less of the two week waiting period which is good so if you've been vaccinated in the states and you come through you don't have to do the two weeks you just have to take oh, a wow. COVID test so that's great because you know it's a little tricky to bring up a huge huge actor that you're paying a million dollars a day to sit in a hotel for two weeks yeah it's not it's not gonna happen on most no. most uh things so so uh, so that's good one of the most interesting things i found when i was on the brewery website was for one i didn't know canada's drinking age was so much lower so it said it was 19 mm -hmm. but it also said to pick up the beer because i guess you guys can order online and go there and pick it up um you need two forms of id so is yeah i thought that was yeah. interesting yeah I, I i don't think i've seen it enforced but they they ask for okay that. yeah i mean i haven't been asked for id for a long time i'm gonna be <laughs> honest with you <laughs> but yeah i'm not sure how enforced it is but one thing that uh, tammy and patty did when lockdown happened we had to shut down all the restaurants they were the first ones to start doing delivery so oh, wow. the customers could call and they would bring you know big growlers and drop them off and yeah so that was pretty fun they would spend their day driving around dropping beer off all day long but it was good. It kept kept money coming through and resourceful. Oh yeah! yeah. Imagine seeing like your uh, the the brewery van driving around town. It probably keeps the name in people's minds because they're not going out and they happen to yeah. look outside and they're like, "Oh wow, that brewery!" It's like an ice cream truck. Place. Yeah, right. I know for at least for us adults, when you're stuck yeah. inside, especially a lot of us have had like kids that we're stuck inside with. Exactly. Mm -hmm. you got, yeah, like, it's like seeing the ice cream, cream truck. truck. Yeah, you get the ice cream truck rolling up, and then the brewery truck comes right around it. And you're like, "Stop! Wait!" <laughs> yes. Exactly. I can just see it now. Yeah. yeah shoving the, kids out of the way. Get out of the right. it's, it's my turn now, sucker. Yeah, exactly. I think for like five months, the only time I left the house was to go to a brewery to get more beer. Mm -hmm. yeah, we had some and, that were delivering, but they were very small radiuses. And yeah, I was just like mm -hmm. just outside of that radius every time it seemed like. Yeah, well, it got you out of the big. house at least. You need That's an excuse. True. I remember those times. It was a weird time, wasn't it? It was. It was like, what are you doing out of your house? And you're like, I swear, I just need some groceries, man. <laughs> <laughs> or, for, or for me, I, I, I remember spending, you know, what, three months or something without going out, you know, just to get groceries. But then one day I went for a drive and I'm like, where, why are there so many people out? I thought the whole town was locked down. <laughs> where is everyone going? <laughs> this is what are you doing yeah. outside? That's right. Why are you happy right now? <laughs> yeah. Well, in Florida, when they close the beaches and the docks is when everybody like lost their mind. Cause it's like, that's when it's serious. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? I can't have uh... this at the beach, but. Yeah. We're here. We're, we're going to, I'm very interested to dive into what you also do professionally uh, as far as the visual effects, but what mm -hmm. I'm even more intrigued and I want to start with first is uh, you wrote a, you created a comic book with a couple friends. I did. What well, with a couple strangers, actually couple, people well, I'd never met before. So I mean, they're, they're friends now. That's how this podcast got started. We were all friends initially, and we've only met in person one time in the year and a half we've been doing this. So, that's so cool. look at that. You yeah. know, meet strangers. <laughs> Back in the day, my mom used to yell at me for meeting strangers on the internet, but uh, now it's what? friendships flourish, right. and this is the way of the world now. So this is the way. Now our kids um, want to marry each other. We didn't yeah. see that one coming. Oh, one how old are the kids? And, uh, like two and, and yeah, uh, five and yeah. That's right. The, the two and the four-year-old are even like. I thought you were going to say, oh, they're 23. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Wow. They just eloped. We're yeah. in-laws now. I mean, good Look, for guys, them, I guess. I'm an ordained minister. I could have at least hooked it up, but all right, right. All right I guess. That's true. No. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it was, I mean, like everyone else, we're sitting at home doing nothing. And uh, and I wanted to challenge myself. I, I love doing stuff like writing movies and then directing them and, you know, getting friends together and shooting little um, shorts and things like that. It's always a good time. But when we're locked down and nobody can do anything, um, had to figure out something. So I took an old script that I had lying around um, that I'd written with my friend Jules, who runs the Super Wiki from Supernatural. And we started going back and forth on wanting to write a, a TV show, a script. And I found this story about Sadie the Goat, who is uh, a 19th century street criminal from New York, who her uh, favorite way of robbing someone was headbutting the men in, a, in the stomach. And then when they were winded, taking all the money from their pockets, hence the goat 
Monica I did notice Lucci that has. too in ah. the comic. I, I noticed. I was like, "Wow, she is certainly causing herself head trauma an awful lot." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sure she has a sore <laughs> neck. I was actually thinking about that for future issues. Um, so, and apparently, she was a real person, and she was a loud mouth, abrasive, you know, um, boisterous woman who, uh, you know, they said. Uh, what was it? a guy named Kit Burns who ran a place called The Sportsman said there isn't a man or woman in New York who is louder, meaner, or with bigger balls than Sadie the Goat. So I'm like, well, I think I know what that character looks like. So <laughs> Jules and I bandied it back and forth and we wrote this, uh, this TV script, uh, a pilot that's similar to what you have in the comics. And then it sat there because it's a huge project that's very expensive and would take a lot of Hollywood behind it. And coming from us, it's it's probably not going to happen. So it just sort of sat there. And when I started thinking, hey, maybe I'll write a comic book, that seemed like the perfect opportunity because you can do whatever you want in a comic book. It's not costing you more to be in 19th century New York or the moon or a different planet entirely. So it's a really cool medium for, for storytelling. Um, and I, I I'll be totally honest with you guys, I'm not a huge comic book person. And, you know, I, I read a few comic books as a kid and then some older, but I'm certainly not encyclopedic by any means. So it's a little daunting to take on a project that you're not super familiar with. Oh, yeah. Maybe there's there's benefits to it, but to me, it was a, a little bit scary. So I put pen to paper and thought I came up with something that sounded about right. And then uh, and then I just needed to find a, an artist. So sure enough, the internet's filled with them. <laughs> you can <laughs> search for things. And uh, I tracked down this great artist in Brazil named Kai Hob, who's a young guy who's just starting out. And I really loved the way he drew people and he drew their emotions and mm -hmm. character. You could see character in people's faces. And that was super mm -hmm. important to me. And he drew action and he drew cities and I just loved everything that he did. So I reached out to him and said, hey, any, any interest? And he was interested and the rest is history. So we, we've done three three books together, three comic books. Yeah. Nice. That's always my question though, for, um, you know, most of the comic book artists that we interview or have on here, they're not also the artists. So that's always hard to like get your vision on paper. So it sounds like you guys had a good understanding of how you wanted the characters. And that was an easy process to make what was in your head come to the paper with the artist you chose. Yeah. I mean, he made it so easy just because he's so talented, but you know, I've been in the business or in the film business enough and directing enough to know that uh, well, how to communicate for one. My job is to communicate with artists, literally for visual effects, to, to get visual effects done. So I think there's a little bit of a shorthand there. Um, but also I sort of just set some pretty flexible boundaries on, on what things should look like. So when I wrote my script, you know, I would lay out where panels should be um, in, in words, what, what I wanted in each panel. And sometimes he stuck to that, sometimes he didn't. But when he didn't, he brought something more and bigger and smarter and from different angles than, than I could have. So not getting too in your head about things, expecting to see something because you, you probably won't see it. Hmm. Just be prepared right. for, for what you, you get oh, kind yeah. of thing. And, and, and there's certainly a case, and I was working with an artist just recently who I thought was gonna be getting that. And then when they sent stuff, it really didn't hit the mark. So it becomes this balance of, you know, how much notes do you give, how much, or do you just move on to someone else? Because right. sometimes it's just not the right artist for the job. So oh, yeah. Luckily, sure. this one was. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that the artwork really matches kind of like the, the brashfulness of the characters even, because the first thing I noticed was just there's there's not like a lot of bright colors because it's kind of like old school new york but at the same time the art was done well enough that it really kind of pops out to you and the, the characters are really well drawn i mean she's a sadie you know the red hair pops out immediately to you the freckles and the way you know you wrote her character as well it, it really matches that she's just kind of like this beacon not like necessarily of hope or light but like she's just like this bright bashful character in new york city and she really the loudness <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> But she still yeah. has a level of innocence to her because she is a child. So it's like you see that like, okay, she's tough and she's been raised on the streets and she's dirty and and these kids are scared of her in this gang she's running, but she still has an innocence to her. And you see that um, more so later on in, in the third one, we see, see more of that, which, uh, you know, we'll just spoil the first one. Um, but no, I really liked it. And I especially loved that you mixed in 
actual history. I think that's really, really cool. And you even in, you know, each of them, you actually spell out, okay, this is the actual history. You did your homework, you did your research and put these characters, you know, put your interpretation on them. And also Sadie, the goat, I didn't even realize why she was named the goat. I thought like greatest of all time. I'm like, is that been an acronym? That's, that's way older than I thought it was. So it's kind of got a double meaning in today's times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I never thought of it that way, but yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, part of my research, cause I really wanted to find out was Sadie a real person, right? Did she actually mm -hmm. exist? Cause she's only mentioned in Herbert Asper's novel gangs of New York, which he wrote in 1923. Yeah. So he wrote it in 23 about, you know, 1860s. I mean, it was way before his time. So I think it's bullshit. I don't think she's real. I don't think she ever existed, unfortunately. So I did all this research. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a reporter or anything like that, but I went through a whole bunch of old newspapers and genealogical stuff, and I couldn't find any sort of reference to the actual person. But what I did find was so many other crazy good stories, like Harmon and Haley, her two cohorts, were two dumb guys that got caught stealing sugar from a quarantine ship in the harbor and it was in the newspaper uh, william Harmon and um haley i can't remember it was thomas haley or something and i thought these were two bumbling idiots and sadie needed to, a small gang so you know pairing those <laughs> people together so those are real people and then you know we later meet dutch herman and he was a real guy he's a safe cracker and a burglar and he was in the rogues gallery and um yeah, I think it's fun just to take these stories and sort of mix and match them. Yeah, when you gave the history of Dutch, I'm hoping he's somebody we see again in the future because I feel, feel like there's a lot yeah. more story there for sure. Yeah, so the way, and this might be controversial, but the way I'm doing it, I'm doing three books at a time and each three are about a different character. So the first three are about Sadie, the next three are about Dutch, and then the, the oh. last three are about Walt Whitman, the American poet. Oh. Interesting. So, and then, you know, hopefully that's volume one and volume two, we go back to Sadie and, you know, we keep touching base with these characters inside that book for a few pages. Um, but the, the majority of the book will be focusing on those people. It's kind of like a Quentin Tarantino movie where like you, you get different characters and then eventually they all kind of intersect. Are you, are you planning on, I don't, you don't have to spoil it if you don't know, or if you don't want to yet, but it seems like they're all going to somehow come together at some point then by writing this, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the idea. Yep, yeah. Oh, that's gonna. Be, that's gonna I be don't know worse. how. I don't know how many books away that is, but. Hey, I mean that's <laughs> we'll the beauty have to of you know creating stuff is sometimes it just comes to you organically, and other times it's like, hey, I gotta really, I I, I wrote myself into this corner. How am I gonna do that? And there there's no pressure or stress to force it into that. But so far, what you've done is I didn't realize it was gonna be like different characters each time that's i was sitting here like all right i need to know what happens next because the way the third one wraps up it's like they're going on this grand adventure now and mm -hmm. then you're going to go to a different so i thought that was really mm -hmm. interesting um yeah um, and again i might get flamed for it <laughs> we'll I mean, have to see when those books come out maybe people might get mad but everybody wants instant gratification right now i mean you're just kind of living that time whereas so i i personally i know lauren and i are both kind of we love that because it keeps us coming back um, and then one of the, like the, the line that jumped out for me straight from issue one is in your, in the opening there, the foreword, it's more fun than depressing. I promise. And yeah, I love that, like that, like, too. That, that really <laughs> stuck with me and, uh, it really set the tone kind of for what you're going in for. Cause it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I'm glad you said, um, I, so many times and why wouldn't you, you see these people living in absolute squalor with nothing but dirt it is depressing. It should be depressing. But I think for the kids that are there, it's just life, man. It's just everyday mm -hmm. life. And oh, yeah. they joke around and they, they pick on each other and there's rumors and, um, you know, so-and-so is fighting with so-and-so and all that schoolyard BS that we see nowadays um, is, is the same as it was back then. And I wanted to capture that, that just kids having fun and being adventurous and uh, telling tales and stuff like that. That was, that was the idea. It's yeah, it seemed like, especially with uh, Sadie too, which the very young minded because she was very focused on getting her gang going. Like she just wanted that right. clout rather than focusing on what her and her crew were doing. It was, no, we need a headquarters and we need to make sure we have, there's like a gang meeting where they're basically gangs are getting split up. We're going to take their people. And she didn't yeah. really think and, things yeah. through. No, but she wants to be important. She wants to be feared. She wants to you know have that clout. Exactly. Mm -hmm. She's a clout chaser. Yeah, I mean, and they just, you know, they kind of go along with it, but they're like, hey, this isn't a good idea. And she's just like, no, we're, we're going in guns blazing, basically. And it's just like, oh, man. 
when she's got right, to overcompensate too it's like who's going to be in a gang that's run by a girl oh yeah they exactly mentioned. and you see yeah. the the like you can feel the tension in those pages when they say that like she's just more adamant of like i provide and i do this and yeah because right. yeah. at first when I started reading it, because, you know, you have things like Hamilton now or, you know, Wild Wild West, like things where it's like we pretend there wasn't racism or misogyny back then because, you know, sometimes it helps the story, but sometimes you need it. So at first I thought, oh, are we just pretending there's not misogyny or racism in the, the 1900s? And then I was like, oh, no, it's there. Because <laughs> as soon as the one kid's like, you're in a gang run by a girl. And yeah, you just saw the fury in her yeah. eyes. Right. Yeah. She, <laughs> what's it to you? Yeah, what kind of gang has a girl leader? This one, you got a problem with that? Yeah, <laughs> I just think she's unhinged and she's over the top. And yeah, there, there's for sure, there's racism and the misogyny and all of that has to exist. Um, but it, I don't want it to take the fun out of the adventure at the same time, right? Oh, yeah. No, um, I don't think it is at we all. We certainly, yeah. um, in, in the next three issues, we get into Chinatown. And Chinatown was just sort of starting in New York at that, point, that time, if you can believe it because a, a lot of the Chinese people were coming from um, the West Coast, you know, from the gold rush on the West Coast oh, yeah. and from, the, from doing that, some of them were traveling all the way over to New York and settling in New York. So there was actually a small development, tiny little area of Chinatown that was just started back then. So we're gonna touch on that in, in the next book too, which is kind of an interesting period that's not talked about a lot. It's really hmm. not. It's one of those things that you kind of like glance over because in history, you kind of get the eh, like the Irish and Chinese. Yeah, they built the railroads. Okay, railroads are here. Move on. Now we're going to the Civil War era, but they don't really touch upon. And so have you always been, is this like history something that you've always been really interested in as far as like, oh, man, I just love this and I love diving into it? Or is this is kind of a newer kind of adventure for you? Um, I think certainly as an adult, not as a kid in school when I had to learn it in, in school, I didn't <laughs> care. <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think especially watching Gangs in New York when that film came out, that Scorsese film, it was just like, oh, this is such a cool time and such a different time period. And, you know, just thinking, you know, all these ships that were coming in every single day, 10, 20,000 people at a time. And these people were coming from another country, have been on a boat. A lot of them died on the way over here. Mm -hmm. And they're plopped down in Manhattan and they're like, okay, there you go, go and live your life. A lot of them didn't move they just stayed exactly where they were chopped off and, oh, yeah. and tried to make a go of it right so you had you know in the course of and again i'm no historian but in the course of a few decades you had you know thirty thousand people to three hundred thousand people in the same manhattan area and it's uh crazy it really did it and they're up. all still there they are well there's you know more than that yeah <laughs> more than that Times yeah they're living a better life now than than, than <laughs> most of them anyways well, they have indoor plumbing and stuff. That's really, uh, they really stepped it, stepped need. the place up. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did you, so I, I thought the, the name of the gang in issue one at the very end, they kind of named their gang, the water street crocodiles. What went, I loved like, that. how did you land on that name? Cause it, it, it is, they make fun of it even. They're like, what word the who? Yeah. What's Please a crocodile? tell me that's not the name. What the hell is a crocodile? I don't know if they even knew what crocodiles were. I mean, I, you assume, but I didn't do a whole ton of research. Um, I didn't have that name until I literally wrote that line in the script. Like I, I didn't know what the heck she was going to call it. And then I wrote that and I thought, yeah, sure. Fine. That's good. I'm not going to do the research to find out if kids knew what crocodiles so were in 1869. You know? It really does. It still yeah. seems like something as juvenile that a kid would come up with because she is still a kid at the end of the day. And you kind of forget right. that going as you dive into the story. Yeah. The and it, they had ra ridiculous names for the gangs, right? Like there was some stupid, stupid names. Like she says, who would you rather be the gopher gang or the tub of blood bunch? Those yeah. were real gangs. Yeah. <laughs> tub of blood bunch. Yeah, that was, really good that sounds like garbage pail kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, so I, yeah, I thought that was, and then I think my biggest question is, um, obviously since we're spoiling this, but there is a, kid orphans are starting to disappear which kind of seems like a subplot that we're gonna get back around to and it seems like something really sinister at the same like we got all this fun but something more sinister is kind of going on as a backdoor plot yeah th and that was something that i really wanted as a framework to tie all three of these stories together mm -hmm. you know these three separate characters mm -hmm. that um the paths cross intermingle from time to time but for the most part they're they're separate um so i needed a, a central plot device and 
when you're dealing with street criminals who would, you know, kill their mother to make a buck, there's very few things to make them want to take up arms. But yeah. hurting kids is probably the only thing that they can uh, say, hey, that's wrong what you're doing. Look at it in prison systems well, that's... today. It's like, you know, right, the pedophiles. You a kid, people like go after those guys too. And they're like, wow, you murdered like somebody at a gas station. So, But anybody right. who's watched Sopranos, there was that, you know, a lot of that was based on actual psychological study where like these mafia men that, you know, they'll murder somebody in cold blood. They have a lot of empathy towards babies and children and animals. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an interesting. Well, that's the hope. Uh, so, I mean, it, most yeah. people get behind it, except of course, Sadie, because who gives a shit about orphans. <laughs> yeah. she she's like i don't care about the homeless brats yeah <laughs> but that could be part of the relationship she has with well i was gonna say her parents that you later, later on, learn about yeah mm-hmm. she uh yeah. so we move into like issue two and issue three where we kind of we learn a little, little bit more sadie. but we do learn a little bit more and you know more about sadie kind of just jumping the gun and uh a, a minor plot point is just like she gets part of her ear bitten off mike tyson style which is just like, mike tyson style she was warned <laughs> She was warned, and uh, again, like with the the four words on here, I really love that you added in like snippets of the newspaper that's showing like this was real, this person was real here, and uh, so that's is that something you're pretty much just like gonna stick with going forward? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to be able to do that. Um, and I have all the stuff you know in a Google Drive folder of stuff that I've just found when I was searching. So yeah, I'd certainly like to do that. And you know that story of of Sadie getting her ear bit off is part of her lore. That's her folklore that she meets Gallus Mag at the Hole in the Wall uh, Saloon and gets her ear bit off. And Gallus Mag is known for that and has a whole collection of them in a jar, which you can see in the movie Gangs of New York. Um, they sort of combined Gallus Mag, Sadie the Goat, and um, Hellcat Maggie into one character in that film. But, Making uh, me want to yeah. rewatch that very long movie. That. So good. It's so <laughs> I, I think it's a great movie. But, oh, it really but I remember it coming out and it was like two VHSs. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Back when you had to actually swap that or like when the, yeah. the DVD you need to flip the disc over halfway yeah. through. Yeah. Oh, man. Those were. Those um, we we used that one for reference, but also a movie called um, Once Upon a Time in America. I don't oh, know if you've I've, seen that. I've, I haven't seen it, but I have heard of it. So that's a Sergio Leone movie with um, Robert De Niro and James Woods and like all these amazing actors. And it's an absolute masterpiece that no one's ever seen hmm. um, because it's like four hours long. Hmm. I'm surprised and when they originally, when Sergio Leone cut it, everybody was like, absolutely not. And the studio cut it down to like two hours and it was, uh, it was absolutely terrible. It didn't make so we sense. need the Snyder so cut. So we, we exactly. Well, the, there is, yeah, there is a, the proper cut out there. Thank God. <laughs> so if you get a chance and you want to watch a movie, that's an absolute masterpiece that no one ever talked Ooh, about. I'm going to have to, yeah. I'm going to have to look that one up. Um, it's really good. I've, yeah. I just pulled up the budget was 30 million. Box office was 5.5 million. Yeah, See, exactly. Studios have been meddling Ouch. since the dawn of time. It isn't just, you know, oh, it's officially got stuck to one Heshi thing. in it, Jennifer Connelly. Yeah. 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 Um, it's got a great cast. Really... Bert, oh, uh, what's yeah. his name? Bert uh... Reynolds? I want to say Bert Ward, but not Bert Ward. Yeah. And Bert Young is his name. William um, Forsyth. Okay. Oh. Interesting. All right. Okay. So Bert Young. So yeah. You. He yeah. played yeah, Bert Joe. Young. <laughs> You'd recognize him to see him for sure. I would have yeah. to see him. The name sounds familiar, but I have to see him. But yeah, that's a stacked cast. All right. I, I'm going to put that on my list to watch because uh, I, I'm in the bag for movies like that 100%. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got Pesci and De Niro. I mean, come on. You yeah. can't go and wrong James with those Woods. two. Yeah, and so. James true. Woods too. That's true. Mm-hmm. So what? what's like the one thing you want readers to take away from these this first set of issues before we move on to you know dutch in the next three that you're going to create what what is the big takeaway that you're really hoping that readers get from your comic here um just that you know what you see about people is not always what you get you know i think with say you see her as this brash uh, feisty angry venomous little person but it's coming from somewhere and that Mm-hmm. I, I, I hope we show that um, when she's with her family and that mm-hmm. sometimes people act out and, and are like this because they do not fit in. They don't feel like they belong anywhere. And so I think some, a lot of people, that they don't feel like they belong. They try to create a place for them to belong. And that's what Sadie's doing. I, and I, know, I know we don't want to spoil issues two and three necessarily, but I, it's such, once you get to issue three, it's such a 180 turn from the- Yeah, at the very end of two. Did you get- to yeah. when she does go back home and her mom, you can kind of see where her angry angstiness comes from because her mom is just brutal to her while the rest of her family is like, 
you know, why are you being mean? No, she's back. Come help in the kitchen right away. Her mom mm-hmm. is just laying it into her. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So there's definitely some history there that we haven't quite exposed yet. Oh, yeah. Um, but there, yeah, some shit happened in the, in the, in the past that, uh, we'll have to oh. come to terms with, uh, later on, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not good. But, um, uh, if I could go on a tangent, that family, okay. that feral family is a, was a real family and they owned that oyster saloon. I don't know if they were connected to Sadie the goat, but Sadie was the head of the Charlton street gang. And that saloon was on Charlton Street and their last name is Farrell. So, I mean, there's a possibility that they were connected. And I literally found that just by, you know, searching through the newspapers for Charlton Street. And I found this story that will actually play out in books seven, eight, nine, um, about this family that runs this oyster saloon. And they were these uh, these crazy Irish people that would rob their customers and um, poison them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the little boy Red Rocks, he was, he was a real bad criminal and eventually uh, you know went to jail a lot for for poisoning people so sort of setting some some stuff in the early stages for that too so um yeah and 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 there was all these newspaper clippings about this feral family and then going to court over the daughter stealing this woman's muff you know what a muff is I like thought a, it was dirty. Yeah, well, it, it's like those <laughs> you you put your hands in it for winter, right? When you go wassailing. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, like yeah. Muffs, there's something that keeps you warm. Pretty close. Like, oh, yeah. No, that's so, like yeah. rich people would do that, right? It puts, totally. Yeah. yeah. And so like there's the this American court case of, of them stealing it, and then yeah, it's it's just hilarious. And the newspapers at the time were absolutely hysterical with their op edness of just the reporter giving their opinion on people. <laughs> It's, it's quite mm, funny. And, well, we need more of that. It's, and I do want to. Oh, go ahead, Matt. It's awful way to build your customer base if you're killing them all. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You get return I, customers like that. Yeah, no. I, ideally, you just want them to sort of black out. <laughs> yeah. Rob them, maybe, but killing them, geez. Yeah, you want to be doing that. Do want to say to anybody listening who's contemplating checking out the Kickstarter or checking out reading these, all the history Ryan has been saying is at the beginning of different issues. So if you, mm-hmm. the history interests you, it's in there for you to read. If the history does not interest you at all, you can literally skip that part. Yeah, yeah, it does so make yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I love it. And when you said the one place was a real place that you could visit in New York, I was like, well, this is, this is really cool. I mean, you, you have yeah. your landscape and you're pe- pulling from real places. So I thought that was awesome. Definitely. Thank you. I, I think one of the, the f- more, the most fun parts about, you know, doing this and reading stories like this to me is, everybody when you think comic books everybody thinks superheroes you know that kind of stuff. but comics like these i love to read because it kind of brings you back down to grounded earth and you also get characters you connect with and stories that you connect with and not everything has to be world ending destruction i gotta read 700 issues of backstory to get here and that's one of the things i really appreciate about like what you're doing and the rest of like the kind of the indie creators it's amazing yeah, I mean, to me, it's just like it's putting TV on paper. I know that's probably so blasphemous to say, but, you know, taking stuff that I love watching on TV, you know, HBO shows that are gripping, heart-wrenching dramas of characters, and why not put that on page? Why not? Mm-hmm. I mean, they take movies and TV shows from paper and put them in the film, so I certainly don't see why it couldn't go both ways, you know? You got ideas, and they even do it with movies. You get movies, and then they're like, Oh, we made a comic book that connects to this movie. Things like that. right or now, book. Wolverine looks like Hugh Jackman. Yeah, so yes, I mean, you can't certainly... you can't not see it. Right, <laughs> it goes both ways, really. And so there's nothing yeah. blasphemous, in my opinion, about it. I feel like, anyways. Well, and one someone, the... go say one Sorry, of the go. what? Oh, I was gonna say one of the 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 things uh, for me is because I think that way. I think about performance. I think acting and stuff waiting for stuff to be drawn i got bored and went and hired all these voice actors to actually voice act the comic book so one of our kickstarter things after you submit you can actually purchase the audio version of the comic um so we'll show video clips of each cell and then voice actors actually acting out the uh the comic which has been pretty fun kind of that's pretty rad and speaking of voice actors and things um because i know that the kickstarter for this closes on the 20th of july um, when can we look forward to getting the, uh, the Kickstarter and for, you know, the next set of series and are people going to be able to still somehow get their hands on this comic as well to kind of go back on and read? 
Yeah, I mean, once it's it's over, uh, we'll be fulfilling by probably the end of the month. I mean, everything's done. It just has to go to the printer and then get sent out from there. Um, you, you know, originally, uh, and breaking news here, originally we were talking that it would be one a month, but because everything's done, we're going to send all three at once. Ooh. So instead of waiting for three months to get it, you're going to get them all at the same time. Nice. Which and makes more sense. And I think the reader will enjoy that being able to sort of binge a little bit mm -hmm. um, and then make them wait for another year for the next three. <laughs> well, it lets you binge, but also leaves you wanting more at the same time. Like it's more so, so for yeah. Me. And for me, I was like, all right, I'm ready to see where this goes. Yeah, I like, hope so. I hold on to my comics until I have at least two or three, sometimes more episodes or issues because I like to be able to sit down for more than a few minutes. But uh, I love nowadays though, you have so many adults reading comics that you're able to go to that, you know, dark side and whatnot and edgy and how you were saying, you know, HBO TV putting to paper. And I think you're more able to do that nowadays in a visual sense than you could 20 years ago. Uh, maybe that's cause I didn't get into comics in until I was an adult. So maybe I feel differently, but yeah. you know, yeah. like no, I think you're right. you know, look at the market for that show, the cartoon right. where they're like shit and blood's going all over the place. Yeah, yeah, uber violent. But there's a market for it. People are watching it, right? Oh, it's a fantastic show and comic. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I certainly, and, you know, working in, in film and television, I met lots of writers and lots of people who write for television also write comics. So that sort of was my introduction to that, you know, like even on Supernatural working with, um, with Adam Glass or with Robbie Thompson, they, they're both uh, prolific comic book writers they've done you know huge books Robbie I think has just finished doing a run on Spidey I think um, oh nice yeah and you know it, it's fun because you know talking to those guys they're like you can do so much more in comics than you can with tv you don't really mm -hmm. have to ask you know for budgetary purposes can we <laughs> blow up this building yeah of course you do you just blow it up it's a comic <laughs> so I think that you'll see and, and I think it's great you'll see a lot more writers getting into comics. I was talking, when I started this, I was talking with Adam Glass and asking him, you know, how do you write a comic book script essentially? And he sent me some comic book scripts that he's written and said, you know, here's the, the way that I do it. And it's great and it's super helpful. And, and that's, that's what I did. But, you know, he was saying, you know, he's written for the big three almost, almost exclusively. Uh, and I, I think Robbie has too. And I think that they both said, and I hope I'm not putting words in their mouth that they would really like to do an indie book where they don't have to ask an editor's permission to do something or they don't have to you know worry about the lore they're just creating it as go oh sorry that's not true yes uh, adam did create an indie book roddy hadn't um because you you have that flexibility and these are creative minds that build worlds all the time so um to be able to turn people loose and say you know, do whatever you you want yeah. is pretty exciting and, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a cool environment there's a kind of like this goes into the breaking news bit, but uh, Scott Snyder just inked a big um, deal with Comixology through Amazon that's going to let him kind of work on some indie projects too. And he's known for, you know, writing Batman and things. And so that's going to put a lot of creativity in the hands. And I think you're going to see a lot more of these bigger comic book writers and artists probably do some stuff like that. Cause like you said, it gives you that freedom. You don't have Marvel or DC breathing down your neck like, I don't care what you do as long as you connect this to this, this to that. And you don't have backstories. Yeah. And it, you can create your own backstories. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. You create your own worlds, which is exciting. And you, sorry, and to, just to go on from that, you also create your own cus uh, customer, but uh, fan base. Oh, yeah. And people that buy your stuff and, and then follow you. So, you know, like Kevin Smith has been doing for 25 years, he makes a movie for Kevin Smith fans. Mm -hmm. And there's right. just enough Kevin Smith fans to make it worthwhile for him to make movies and he makes the movies and they like the movies. So it's a nice little circle. And that's sort of the, what I see comic books doing is Kevin Smith wants to go and make a comic book. He'll have the people to buy that book and it'll pay for itself. And maybe he doesn't get rich off it, but you're creating and you're putting stuff out in the ether and who knows where it goes. Right. Yeah. And they did the read for clerks three today. They did. Do the I saw that. I'm so excited, that. man. I'm so excited. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kind of, I think Clerks 2 is. Um, oh no, sorry, uh, Jane Silent Bob was probably one of my all time faves. Oh, Strike Back, like, yeah, all that's just my introduction to him, and it just spiraled from there. And ever since then, I've you know, obviously, I didn't start watching these till you know, I was like middle school, high school. Um, but I, I've always been such a fan, and kind of speaking towards like filmography and stuff, I want to touch real quick before we dive into what you do professionally and talk about your YouTube mini series that connects with beer. 
um you sent us the episode <laughs> right. and right. i kind of i enjoyed it it was it was a lot of fun it's a small struggling brewery kind of trying to figure out how to get bigger and it ends with somebody mistakenly adding them on twitter and all of a sudden they got right. all these people coming in it was kind of awesome yeah they blow up their spot yeah um yeah it's called brew stars and um we shot it god i don't know five years ago i think um with the canadian actor freddie waniak who was from a TV show called Corner Gas, which was really, really popular in Canada for many years. Um, and Fred was in it, Lauren Cardinal was in it. Um, Andrew uh, uh, Varber, who's a hilarious YouTube, uh, and he's quite, I think he's, he's on TikTok now doing really well. Um, and, and a bunch of other people, uh, we got together and did this show. And you know, we wanted to show what it would be like if you were running a craft brewery. And so it's about two brothers who are running a craft brewery, dot, 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 into the ground because they have no (laughs) idea how to run a business. They know how to make beer. Um, And we just thought it'd be a fun comedy. Um, So it was pitched as a a pilot. And then, you know, there'd be a series thereafter of them trying to make a go of it. And, uh, you know, it didn't get picked up or anything, but it was hell of fun to make. Uh, 10 minute long pilot, I think. So is that the only one you guys have made so far? just yeah. the pilot and it just because I, I i think it was almost one of those like ahead of its time because netflix had a craft beer show or whatever too and if you're talking mm-hmm. five years ago this is before everybody you know, this is before that yeah in fact i was talking with somebody from netflix and mentioned it and they're like oh we're actually developing a craft beer show I'm like, yeah, of course you are yeah I, to, be, to, <laughs> to be fair I, i'm gonna speak on my personal behalf i didn't enjoy uh-huh. that show uh, about the two brothers owning a brewery i personally didn't right. so very much but they got that it from you. Show, and they're still, I will, they stole it from you is how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> that show was good and enjoyable in parts. And then there was it half of it seemed like they were just trying too hard. Yeah. And it was like, uh, I'm fine with raunch, but the raunch was forced. Mm-hmm. But then they would have like little uh, tidbits of like, you know, talking about, you know, Yakima Valley or, you know, they would throw in these little things that only people that were really into beer would get. And that was kind of cool. And they were also making fun of craft beer at the same time, admiring craft beer. Mm-hmm. And they had the guys from the, one of the guys from the league was in it. So they, Oh, which guy? Um, I Kevin, I think it was Kevin. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So he was in there and I think he was one of the creators as well. Uh, oh. And yeah, so, and one of the main characters was in Orange is the New Black. And so they had a good cast going. Oh, yeah, he was the cop in Orange is the New Black. Yeah, uh, but it just, they just didn't hit the mark. It was such yeah. a, kind of a waste. I'm going to say they took the idea from me. So maybe they need to combine yeah. your show and that show yeah. and there's your, your gold. Well, everyone I pitched it to said, nah, it's not exciting enough. It's not, you know, unique enough. So I said, okay, we went back, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, to the, uh, the vat as it were and mixed it up so then it turned into a show called fermented about two brothers who are running a craft brewery and accidentally kill the world's most famous beer expert and have to cover up the murder <laughs> <laughs> so it's a farcical comedy of them trying to hide the body and you know they they abscond with his phone and start tweeting as him to try and throw the cops off the trail and yeah that's hilarious oh that's i like that great. so talking about movies and stuff you do some visual effects work. Tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of how you got into that and what started that adventure. Yeah, uh, I'm a visual effects supervisor in television and films. Um, and that means I, I plan and implement ways of shooting film so that we're able to take those shots and turn them into really beautiful visual effects, CGI type stuff. Um, I've been doing it for over a decade now. I got in just as an editor, a visual effects editor, because I really enjoyed video editing. And then um, just really loved the trade after that and moved up and up and up and eventually got to a point when I was going to set and be part of the shooting and it was amazing. And every day you walk onto set and you're like, I can't believe I get to do this for a living and get paid for it. And it's the coolest job ever. Oh, no doubt. So do you work like mostly, obviously I was looking at your thing with CW then being in that area since they film literally everything in that area. Yeah, they film a lot of CW stuff here. Yeah, I mean, I've done a few of their shows, um, Supernatural and um, I, we did a show called Frequency, which was really cool. Mm-hmm. And uh, just finished working on Superman and Lois. I only did uh, four or five episodes and I was filling in for someone there. Um, yeah, they, they do lots of stuff here. I, I've done a bunch of stuff. I worked on a show called C for Apple with Jason Momoa. That was a lot of fun. And we actually got to shoot up near where the brewery is actually on Vancouver Island. So that was really cool. Wow. Um, I wasn't actually supervising that. I was a wrangling, but uh, yeah, that was exciting. And 
I'm doing a film right now that I can't really talk about, but it's based on a comic book and it's an action movie and there's some A-list actors in it and it's going to be great. You sound like nice. you're just living my dream life almost because that's not incredible. <laughs> you, get to, you get to daydream for a living almost. It's amazing. It, it, yeah, no, it is amazing. And I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. And yeah. Whenever you walk onto set and there's this huge set build, you literally have to be in reverence and be like, oh, God, I can't believe I'm here. Yeah. I, well, how does working on Supernatural versus Superman and Lois compare? Is um, it similar? Some, or of is it, it... some of it is similar. In fact, in those two shows, they're similar because. Uh, they both had an in-house team. Not all of Superman and Lois was done with an in-house team, only a, a small portion of it. But Supernatural was done with an in-house team, meaning all of the visual effects artists also worked for production. So just like the key grip and the and the lighting guys get paid, so do the visual effects employees get paid from the production. So that's pretty rare. Um, but some of it, uh, some of the stuff was done through uh, Lois like that, and uh, it was good. It, it's a lot of fun. Um, I think Superman and Lois had a much bigger budget than Supernatural, but Supernatural had 23 episodes a season. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that that sort of budget is spread out a lot more than 15, I think, that they did for Superman and Lois. Was Superman and Lois, I don't know if you're going to know this one, um, was it shorter because of COVID or are they just going to be doing that with Superman and Lois? Yeah, I, I mean, 15 is a lot nowadays. Uh, most mm -hmm. of the time it's 10 episode, 12 episode. If you're on Netflix or Apple, it's like eight or four sometimes. Right. Yeah. But we're seeing with all so, this superhero CW, like Flash is Flash is pushing it with their. I don't you know, know how many are they, how many are they doing? Are they're they doing still doing like 20, 20 21, I think 23. The sweet spot is that ten to fifteen, to be honest with you, because you can still tell a lot of good story in there without adding too much filler. That's just like, what are we doing this week? Yeah, actually, me. it was um, Stephen Denight, the uh, writer of Spartacus and many other things, was talking the other day about how it's so hard to make a show with eight episodes or, or four episodes because you need to spread out those costs, right? So if, mm. for instance, if we want to talk about Supernatural, the Men of Letters bunker that they spent, you know, the last five seasons in, that was a big build and that's expensive and that has to sit there. So, you know, instead of paying, I'm going to pick a number, say $2 million to build this set and you only use it for one or two episodes, you can take that $2 million and spread that out over 23 so now it's just costing you, you know, whatever, a hundred grand an episode, mm. and you're going to use that set for the course of the season. So there's certainly sense. less big, huge builds that have to stand on their own when you can spread it out like that. That does make mm. a lot of sense. How, how different is it then? Obviously, is it more challenging working on, say, a TV show versus a film? Because I know there's obviously different budgets, what you can do with the effects, things like that. Do you find one more fun than the other or one more challenging than the other? Well, I think with TV, it's a lot more challenging because your turnaround is usually a lot faster, right? Um, oh. Netflix being an exception because a lot of the stuff on Netflix, you complete all of your episodes before it ever goes to air. But with Supernatural, there was a, you know, a point in the season where an episode would air and we would only be two weeks behind it, maybe. So we'd be finishing up a shot and that, that episode's going to be airing in like 10 days. That's a very tight turnaround for getting everything else completed. Oh, yeah. So I, I feel like you have more breathing room in film and in um, in like streaming Netflix and, and things like that than you do with traditional television. Absolutely. That makes sense. What was, I, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of my wife real quick. She told me to ask this, but what was kind of some, some of the uh, favorite effects that you've done so far? Is there anything that stands out in particular to you more? I mean, I know because everybody kind of has that one thing that they think back on like, man, that was, that was it. I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, I did season two of The Order on Netflix and we got to do full oh, werewolves. Yeah. So building a full werewolf from nothing because we didn't reuse anything from season one. That was pretty cool. And working with um, the team, the uh, the vendors that, that built it was really fun. And then I brought in motion caption uh, for that. So motion capture. So we would go to motion capture studio and and record all the movements and then apply those to the werewolves to try and help them. That was, that was a lot of fun. Um, but I think there's this shot in the last season of Van Helsing that we did Ooh, uh, right before. Yeah. Thank you. Right before COVID we went to um, Slovakia and we were in Slovakia for over a month shooting the first three episodes of season five. And that was pretty awesome just in general, just to be in Europe shooting uh, for your oh, yeah. job. 
And uh, we shot at this really cool castle and we, we made Trisha Helfer climb like 500 steps to the top of this castle spire. And we had a drone that would start on her standing in the doorway as she casts this evil spell and the day turns to night as clouds and evil roll over and we drop back on the drone and it looked fucking awesome. And, nice. uh, and on the day we're like, yes, yes. Everybody was cheering because it was so cool. So um, that's probably one of my favorite shots. That's okay. awesome. I do want to make a comment real quick because, you know, it was supernatural. I feel like, you know, people who haven't seen it have a certain perception of what they think it is, which I think is wrong. But the visual effects on that show, I mean, throughout the 15 seasons, there's a lot. I mean, every episode you have visual effects going on that are just crazy. I mean, you have so much different urban legend being brought in and so much going on and so many people being thrown across the room and all sorts of things. So that's yeah I just wanted to mention that and so that's that's really awesome and I'm sure that was and like you making the comment about the time turnaround it's like that had to have been very intense huge yeah it really was um I was a coordinator on that show so I got to go on set quite often well most of the time I'd spend on set but then work with the artists to you know organize the stuff Mark Malosh was the supervisor on that show from uh, he was an artist for the first seven seasons and then he was the supervisor there on after and Grant Lindsay was the producer, the visual effects producer. And yeah, it was a lot of work. And you know, how many freaking times do you have to do colored eyes? Or, you know, like, okay, what is this guy's eyes? Okay, oh, we have a, a what is it now? This kind of monster? Great, what color right. are their eyes gonna look like? Um, <laughs> I think every single episode, at least one. Oh yeah, for sure, yeah. And you know, it changed in the earlier seasons, they would put black contacts in for demons and then eventually we were just like, nah, we'll just do them. Um, <laughs> for the most part they were just all visual effects or fangs growing in um a lot of that sort of stuff but um so that's visual effects that's not like fake teeth it's both okay. so they'll have fake teeth made um uh really nice prosthetic teeth that sort of go over top of their teeth sort of like shark teeth but when they come in and they we would animate them coming in okay and then for all the talking and stuff after we would just put the false teeth in so that we didn't have to always do that so it's always a, a it's always a combination of special effects makeup, us special effects, wh whoever is involved. We all try to have a little piece of it. But even with like dead people, do you ever work on the props, or is that a totally different department? Uh, well, props is a different department entirely. Um, so anything that the actors touch will typically be a prop, and that's handled by the props department. Now, would you handle the blood splatter that we see almost oh, yeah. every episode? Uh, Yes and no. It depends. If you see it hitting something like a wall and dripping down, that's probably special effects that's got a blood cannon that they're, huh. they're shooting it with. What then? Huh. Uh, what is like your least favorite kind of effect that you have to do then? Is there something that you just see and you're just like, oh God? Because you just mentioned <laughs> the eyes. Question. It made me think of it. Yeah. Like, oh, how many different color eyes do we have to do? Is there one that's yeah. just like, oh, please? Um, yeah. Stabbing in the head. Oh, really? Head stabs are the hardest because you can't fake it, right? So if you had a, a blade with, or a hilt with no blade, okay, fine. You can stab somebody in the chest with that and we would add the blade in, but you're not going to take your fist and slam it into an actor's head pretending you're stabbing them. That's true. You probably get oh. a concussion. <laughs> right. So you don't want to hurt the actors. So um, even the stuntmen, you don't want to do that. Um, so then what happens is you have to pretend like you're hitting. But when you do that, you're like, ah, and your hand is moving around like this. But if you had a blade in somebody's head, your hand can't move like this. True. So then we end up having to stabilize somebody's hand. And if somebody's hand is in front of their face and it's doing this, but now we're stabilizing it, now I'm going to have all these holes in my face that have to be filled and painted in. Hmm. Uh, so if you watch The Walking Dead, they made the thinking. really <laughs> bad decision of the only way to kill a zombie is to stab them in the head. So if you go back and you look and you think, God, it looks so fake, you know why. It's because they can't actually hit somebody in the head, so they're faking it a lot. I never Interesting. thought about it. That I would have figured so, it would have been something else, but that makes a lot of sense because you just can't. Yeah, you can't just walk up and be like, "Bam!" Guess what? Andrew Lincoln's out for three weeks because I just bashed his head in or something like that. It's or now exactly. you have an extra suing you for <laughs> yeah. trauma to the head. Yeah, totally. Yep, yep. Or or you get this huge bill because somebody's hand just wouldn't stay still, and and it, yeah, it costs way more. So. Um, generally, if I'm working on something, I, I'm like, no, no head stabbing. Let's not 
Let's not do any of that. Please, anywhere else. That that would. I wonder if that explains why, in like zombie shows, they go anywhere but the head for like the longest time while we're sitting on the TV. Like, please, get them in the head. <laughs> well, yeah, because a lot of times, if they're going to put explosive squibs on them, they don't want to put them on people's heads. Yeah. Right? If they're doing it practically, so mm. they'll put it on the body. We see a lot of decapitation in Supernatural. Is that a hard one, or is that pretty? Yeah. yeah okay. Um, we <laughs> dialed it in. Like honestly, I think that we're our show uh, was probably the most decapitations on any series i'm guessing i'm just oh i'm five yeah um but yeah so we sort of developed a, you know ways of doing it where uh, we made it really simple we would ask for like a head with a wig that matched the actor's hair oh. and the head didn't have to look like them it just had to be a prop head and a lot of times it would be a rubber head and we'd put like a fishing weight inside the cranium so that it had a little flop to it instead of just being a light thing and I'll tell you, I'll spoil the magic for you. So um, the actor is a demon and they're about to attack. And then we say, and three, two, one, whoop, and they act like their head's chopped off and then they just fall right back down. <laughs> okay. And then we, we, we take their head and we chop it out and separate it from their neck in, in post. And then uh, when they fall away, we, we paint their head out and then we take that head and we animate it. And then when we're shooting it, I'll step in there with the head holding it like this in the same place as the actor's head and I'll flip it. So then you go from real head to flipping fake heads in a few frames and you don't notice. And hopefully it sells and then blood shoots everywhere and people scream. <laughs> Crazy from there. I, yeah, hopefully that's the way it works. So our, our favorite one was in episode or, uh, eight, I think it was eight or one, the first episode in series eight where Dean is in purgatory. Mm -hmm. And he's getting all dirty and super handsome and the mm -hmm. vampire is coming and then he chops his head off on the tree and yes. the body falls down and then the head rolls off. That was, I think, the first one that we did like that. Yes. Nice. I watched the one with Abaddon the other day where they just, and so her head good. hangs there for a second yes. and it falls. Yeah, she's so good. Is there also, I guess, does it sometimes get awkward on set where, you know, obviously when you can't do magic from your hands, is it sometimes you're just, because I've always wondered, like, especially in these movies where you do a lot of magic, is it just goofy looking or is it just, hey, everybody knows this is what we got to do? Oh, like is Elizabeth Olsen has made the yeah, comments about her hands. Like contain your laughter, even though like you're, you have this vision in your head and you're just like trying not to laugh, things like that um I, I i'm not trying to not to laugh because i'm thinking a million other things at the time but i'm sure other people are um on season four of van helsing with trisha helfer again she plays dracula the dark one and when she's brought into existence we said um smoke is going to pool out of sam this character and it's going to swirl around and out of the swirl she's going to appear and she says i'm dracula that's really cool so of course, there's no smoke there because we're going to add it. So we're like, okay, Trisha, so you're going to stand here and I'm just going to need you like to spin around. And then as you turn around, <laughs> you stand up. And she's like, what? She's like, this feels really stupid. I'm like, no, no, just like with flowy with your dress and you go around. She's like, this feels really stupid. I'm like, it's going to look good. So luckily, <laughs> it looks ridiculous right now, but it's going to look yeah. great in post. Yeah. So luckily, she trusted me. And then when she saw it, she's like, it was, it was good. That's awesome. I mean, you, they're probably so, I mean, you see like what was Mark Ruffalo calls his Hulk outfit, the man canceling outfit, because he has to wear this like leotard with all these things on it to, you know, oh, get yeah. the CGI. So I'm sure a lot of them feel stupid, but it always looks amazing to us because I of you. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hope so. Like yes. Him, yes. Yeah. But also because of them. So like when we did um, the order, we would have the motion actors on set. So although we didn't have them in werewolf suits, we still had people there acting like werewolves so that A, the actors have something to act against and B, something that gives us lighting reference and movement reference and animation and that sort of stuff. So they'd be dressed in those gray suits with the tracking markers and be acting like werewolves. And I, I think it helps. I think it helps the actors react to them, which is good as well, instead of an invisible werewolf in front of you. It gives them something to go off. Hmm. That makes well, sense. Yeah, it, it does make sense. It's kind of cool, like peering behind oh. that almost, because there, there's a lot of work that goes into even a 30 minute TV show. You guys, you know, whether it's you, the director, the actors, props, you know, um, clothing, all that kind of stuff. There's there's so much that goes into it. And a lot of times, you know, it's easy for everyone to kind of bash, you know, the CGI of things and the visual effects. But you guys really make a lot of these things happen as we've kind of just talked about. So it's, it's really just cool peering into everyday life and some of the things that you guys have to do and tricks of that nature. 
Yeah, well, yeah, thank you. It's it's a lot of fun, and uh, we're we're certainly no island because uh, you know we we need to rely on all the other awesome trades people yeah. around us to 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 help and and make it happen. So it, it sure. is fun for sure. Lauren, before we wrap up, do you have any other last questions? I know. I know the supernatural in you. I know you had. A lot I know. Of I'm holding back, man. I'm sure holding back. Get... No, don't hold back. Ask me anything you want. I'll, I'm happy to answer. <laughs> All right, I got one last question for you. Um, okay. With you owning a brewery and Jensen owning a brewery, was there ever any beer talk on set? Um, yeah. Although, I mean, we used to talk about breweries for sure, and I remember opening when when we were talking about opening New Tradition. I'd already left the show at that point, um, but we used to talk about drinking whiskey a lot because we were both scotch whiskey drinkers too um so yeah but we would we'd rap about different beers in in vancouver and stuff that he's tried and stuff that i like that sort of stuff yeah nice because i know the beer made it into the show yeah isn't that cool i haven't tried it is it good beer you know it's better than i expected so my expectations Mm. were kind of low because when i was watching i think it's season 14 when michael is possessing dean and they're in rocky's bar and uh he's like oh i got a great local beer from austin cosmic cowboy so i looked it up on untapped and the rating was mediocre at best but mm-hmm. then when i went to the brewery i went with another friend and he's big into supernatural and big into beer as well um and it exceeded both of our expectations i brought a crowler home as well like one of their hazies nice. was my favorite and honest, uh I thought you were sending me one of those beers so when i opened up the box and there wasn't i was like you know that makes a lot of sense i would do the same I didn't think you cared. I still have some. I can send you a Cosmic Cowboy IPA. I don't know why. I just, I was like, oh, I can't wait to try. <laughs> I kind of figured I'm like, eh, Matt won't appreciate it. So I'll save it for somebody who will. <laughs> but if you want one, I still have some. And I'm saving one of the other Pilsners for when my Castiel Funko Pop arrives. Mm. But um, uh, well, I was talking to somebody because we, we did the whole trip was based around beer. So we weren't just going to family business. We went to a whole bunch of breweries. And so we were talking to somebody at a craft beer bar and they're like, yeah, when they first opened, you know, their beer was all right. And, but it's gotten better and better and, and better. And uh, actually Woodland Empire, who will be on next week, uh, they're a brewery in Boise and they know the head brewer at Family Business. And um, yeah, I think, I thought the beer was great. So it ex- very much so exceeded my expectations. There was a great, like um, peppery stout was really good that I had there. And then I really liked the, the hazy. Uh, this one's good. It's, it's better than your average IPA, but it's not like, phenom- like I wouldn't have bought a six pack of it if it wasn't in the show. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> but you would have, you wouldn't have gone to the brewery if it wasn't in the show either, right? Well, I wanted to go to Jester King as well. So we did okay. Jester King and family business the same day. Um, honestly, if I was in, I don't know the brewery, it's such a beautiful brewery. Mm-hmm. And there's another one, Acapon, we did Acapone or something that we did that wasn't far from there. There was a few others I would have liked to have done in Dripping Springs. It's a great, mm-hmm. great beer area if you haven't done that area for beer. I haven't. Mm, that's really cool. There. I will get there. But... Is there, a, so we're both where you got, well, you're in Florida, right? You live mm-hmm. in Florida. Is yeah. it pretty big in craft breweries? Like, are they yeah. popular? I- I feel like we're very underappreciated for craft beer, um, but we have Cigar City is a big one that a lot of people know, uh, and Tripping Animals is really getting on the the map there in uh, Miami. One of the best ones in the area is Orlando is uh, Tactical, and they're still kind of small, oh, yeah. but they make some phenomenal beer. When Matt visited us, that was the first place I was like, you have to go there, especially because he's in the military and they're uh, vet owned. But yeah, craft beer is blown up here, and Tampa is a huge one for craft beer. Right. Is that just in the last few years or has it been like that for a while? Um, I would say in the Orlando area, just the last five years, it's kind of exploded. Uh, Tampa Mm -hmm. was a little bit before that, but I mean, 10 years ago, I think I was still drinking Budweiser. I was starting Mm -hmm. to drink Sam Adams. I was drinking Sam Adams because I'm from Boston. So yeah, Mm -hmm. but we've always had Yingling and that's considered craft to some. That's true. Mm -hmm. Just because it's brewed in Tampa. Um, I would say Idaho's beer scene is pretty big. It's gotten bigger. Uh, I didn't know what to expect because I'm obviously, I'm not from here. So I, mm-hmm. I'm from New England from, I literally, a 15 minute drive puts me in the heart of Boston. So I'm from, I'm used to like the city, things of that nature. And I came here and I'm like, oh God, what is going to, but I'll say Boise. It's really not bad. The beer scene here is pretty good. Um, the general vibe of the actual city of Boise is, it's, it's pretty nice. And I was very surprised. Yep. I, I, it's probably going to get bigger and bigger, right? It's the, I want to say it's the number one, if not top three, like most growing cities in America, just because yeah. they're bringing Amazon's here, Micron, which is a tech company. 
um, bodybuilding.com, which is, you know, a lot of people use that if that's what you're into as far as weightlifting. Like this Sensi is another one that's based out of, so there's like a lot of these big places that are centralized right here. So everyone's kind of flocking here. And of course, right. the whole, like all the locals are like, oh, we don't want people to move here, but it's like your economy's mm-hmm. growing big and the housing market. Yeah. So it's, yeah, well, it's still, still affordable place to live, right? Oh my is, Florida. Uh, so, uh, yeah. You can't find a house right now in the city and surrounding area that's less than 300 grand in like the housing. So there's not enough houses. So they're building outwards rather than, because they can't build upwards, essentially. They're not allowed to build a mm-hmm. second line because of the mountains that sit right behind it. So there's some law in place. So they can't build upwards. So they're building outwards and it's killing a lot of like farms and all that kind of stuff. It's, like, it's this whole crazy thing that I had no idea even existed because I didn't even know this place was a state until I got here. To be honest. <laughs> I didn't you, didn't, you didn't know yeah. that? <laughs> I, did, I knew it was a state, but like I didn't know it was like a real. You didn't know people things. lived there. It was one of those things. Yeah. It's like you hear of Idaho and you're like, oh yeah, potatoes. But then you get here and it's like, yeah, but there's also a lot like the, the hiking is phenomenal. The outdoors is phenomenal. And then, you know, you're four hours from Salt Lake City, eight hours to Seattle, six hours to Portland. Just you're kind of centralized. Yeah. So it's it's kind of cool because I'd never been in the Pacific Northwest. So this is letting me kind of explore the, the Northwest in a way. And you yeah, sent me and some phenomenal cool. beer. It is. But, so have you always yeah. been in Vancouver or are you there for work? Yeah, uh, no, I've lived here for the last 20 something years. I, I grew up in uh, sort of the center of the province of a place called uh, the Okanagan Valley, which is very desert, very arid, and it's known for its wines. Uh, so there's oh, you know, hundreds of wineries around where I grew up there. Um, and that's like the industry is, is the wine trade. It's sort of like the Napa Valley of Canada, Western Canada anyways. Um, but yeah, I, I moved out to the, you know, the coast when I was 20 and been here for, for them. And I like it. I like, it. it's a big city. Um, you know, there's, it's expensive. It's really, oh, yeah. really freaking mm-hmm. expensive. My- we went looking at houses on the weekend for my wife and I, and it's just the two of us wanted something that was detached and, we're an hour out of the city and we couldn't find anything for under 1.2 million. Holy so, whoa. Smokes. Good. Yeah. I was, yeah. That's crazy. Wow. It is crazy. So how do you, how do people get by? I, you know, we, we talked to the mortgage broker and my wife and I are both in the film business. We do very good. And I said, like, how are young people buying houses? Like a million dollar mortgage is, is like 5,000 bucks a month. How oh, yeah. are you paying that for the next 25 people years? People are living with their parents and they're like 30 yeah. still. It's it's insane. It is truly crazy. Yeah. 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 Well, I do uh, bankruptcy law and I get a lot of people that are like, oh, I'll never own again. And so you're having the older generation and the younger generation who never wants to own because of what happened to their parents. And then the older generation, a lot of them are like, I lost my life savings in 08. I'll never own again. Uh, oh, yeah. So. You see a yeah, lot of renters, which in the end they end up wasting more money, but they're just terrified. That's to why we bought again. a house in the last two spots. But yeah. on a positive note, I want to end this on a positive note. I've been told <laughs> we're still recording. Let's talk we? more about <laughs> the are. slums of New York. No, there note, you go. Look at that. <laughs> he brought it in. full circle. It all does tie. In. I have been told repeatedly that Vancouver has some of the best food that the Northern Hemisphere has to offer. Mm. Is that true? Because you've you're a traveling man. So I want to know, like, how what is your opinion on the food sitch? Yeah, it's great. I mean, Vancouver is like living in an international airport. I mean, it's literally made up of every uh, every person from around the world lives here. So, you know, it, whatever kind of food you want, you you get. So, you know, some of the best sushi in the world is, is out of Vancouver, if you like sushi. Mm. Um, or um, amazing Chinese food, like traditional Chinese food or Western Chinese food. Um, yeah, I mean, you name it, it, it's it's here. So very good food and very good beer. And very, mm. very good weed too, I've heard. <laughs> so I've been whole, told. So yeah, so- And donuts, the, right? You have good donuts? Yeah, they're all right. Yeah, there's some good <laughs> donuts, but uh, like a Tim Hortons donut, no. <laughs> See, it's, I can, Dunkin' Donuts, I'm a Dunkin' Donuts guy, but I, there are I definitely the better donuts out there, and I just love oh, yeah. the shit of coffee. Artisanal so, donuts, that's what There's that's neither what here nor there. <laughs> um, I seriously, though, I think maybe in the next year, I'm going to work on getting up to Vancouver, because it's just a place that keeps popping up and popping up, and I got to get well, out that's there. That's really cool. Yeah, you might as well. I mean, it's not that far, right? So You're close, yeah. It's really not that 12 far. 12-hour drive, maybe? Maybe? At, at most. Um, yeah. And there's a lot going on. Everyone who I've talked to sold me, so... Well, if for nothing else, for the beer, because there's a ton of great beer. I'll take you to some IPAs that will blow your mind. 
Oh, I, I love IPAs that to, blow uh, my mind. I, I'm very mm -hmm. much looking forward to getting to your guys' brewery. And then, yeah, I just love going on some good uh, beer tours. And then, of course, if I'm drinking beer, I'm going to have to eat food. So the sushi mm -hmm. spots sound right up my alley. So Oh, tons of them. I think, what did I hear? I, I, I'm pretty sure that there was, uh, I, this, this can't be right, but I'm sure it said 200 breweries in Vancouver proper and then 150 on Vancouver Island, something like wow. that. Wow. Like, that's like San Diego right. numbers. Smokes. That's insane. Yeah, there's there's a ton. There is a ton. Um, so yeah, the, you'll 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 want a week. I'm I'm gonna make that happen. I don't care how it's gonna happen. We're gonna get out there. Ryan, I can't thank you enough for you know reaching out to us, talking with us. You know, we we talked about um, a lot of great things, but the most important thing is uh, check out Slums of the Empire City. Make sure you get your hands somehow on this. Check out the comic book. Be on the lookout for more to come. Follow them. Uh, go ahead, promote yourself. Tell us where we can find the the comic. Tell us where we can find yeah. you. And yeah, um, follow the comic at Slums Comic. Uh, that'll link you to wherever you need to go uh, after the Kickstarter, uh, and we ship. I'm sure it'll be available on Comicsology or your your places where you get comics. Uh, probably not stores, but certainly online in digital format. And I'm sure you can order a print uh, if you want. Uh, you can follow me, Ryan underscore Curtis, on Twitter, and uh, Sigil Digital is my uh, website. Nice. Awesome. I'm about to go right now and uh, get on the Kickstarter bit. I've been meaning to. I just keep forgetting. Um, but two I'm days left. To... There's two days. I'm going in right right as soon as we end this. I'm, I'm going right awesome. in, and I'm getting me at least the uh, the three digital prints to, to have. And again, thank you sincerely from the bottom of our hearts for uh, joining us tonight. It was a lot of fun. And uh, who knows, we'd, we'd love to have you back again to talk about some more exciting adventures. And Oh, I would love that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it's, it's an honor to be here, guys. I really do appreciate you and I appreciate your support. It's, it's awesome. Absolutely. Appreciate you letting me geek out a bit about Supernatural. Yeah. Matt oh, we didn't even get to talk about the good stuff, like how <gasps> handsome Jensen Ackles is in person or <laughs> how tall Jared is in person. Ooh, I guess we're just going to uh... definitely have to have you back for a future episode then so we can really talk about the good stuff. And, uh, shout <laughs> out See, to my husband knows that he's my list. Oh, uh, which Jensen or Jared? Jensen. Uh, yeah. Come on, he he's brews on beer. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's just perfection there. But you, have you ever had a, a hug from Jared, though? No, I haven't had a hug from well, either. Then you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> I'm not a hugger. I'll go with the beer. Uh, that's okay. I will it's like a it. mouth hug. Wait, that's not. No. <laughs> <laughs> the last, I just want to give one last shout out to our friend Noam from Dads on Dayquil. He's also a big Supernatural fan. So Noam, this episode is dedicated to you as well. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. We'll be back next week with a lot of great stuff. And go check out this comic book. Go check out Ryan's work. And uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Cheers. Yes. Cheers. This has been a Hops News production. You can find Hops News on all your favorite podcasts and social media platforms at Hops News. Cheers.